So, you live here, and you're having a baby. Congratulations! Here's some more good news. If you're employed, there's a good chance you'll get paid time off to take care of your new bundle of joy. And you'll probably get to go back to your old job when that leave is over. 95.6% of Earth's population lives in countries where at least one parent gets this time. So your odds are looking pretty good. But if you're part of the other 4.4%, well, you get nothing. You might get time off, but it almost certainly won't be paid. That's if you live on this small island, any of these tiny islands, or in this gigantic economic powerhouse whose 2020 GDP was $6 trillion more than second place China. To be fair, nine states and Washington DC have passed their own paid leave laws since 2002, but federally? And then I can be very brief with the United States, we have nothing. You've probably heard this before. There's no end to coverage on the subject. Just us and Papua New Guinea. If you don't know, as of right now, the United States is only one of five countries without guaranteed paid family leave. 88% of working mothers will not get one minute of paid leave. But why is it this way? The US is just as wealthy and developed as these countries and operates with similar governmental structures. So what gives? Most countries have some combination of maternity leave, paternity leave, and parental leave, which is for either parent after individual leave ends. Provisions vary for LGBTQ and other non-traditional parents. Here's how it works in practice. Let's compare the US to none of these. It's a media favorite to compare social policies in the US to those of Nordic countries, which are extremely generous in comparison. But they have very different social and economic structures from the US. Instead, let's compare to similar nations, the United Kingdom and Canada. A pregnant person in the UK can take 39 weeks with about 30% of their average weekly pay. A pregnant Canadian can take a total of 51 weeks at about 50% of their average wage. In each country, these payments are capped at a certain amount. Taxes cover the cost. Though UK employers pay up front, the government typically reimburses the vast majority. Finally, both people are entitled to return to their old jobs, or at least similar ones. Sounds pretty good. Not Finland or Sweden good, but good. But in the U.S.? And then I can be very brief with the United States, we have nothing. The 1993 Family and Medical Leave Act entitles new parents to 12 weeks of job-protected leave, without pay. The bright side is that this act provides the same leave for a major illness or injury, or to care for a relative. That's the family and medical part. The downside is that the caveats of the bill mean it only covers about 56% of the workforce. Now, let's return to the why. Countries in the industrial world, which was primarily North America and Europe, um, really began paying attention to this issue at all in the last third of the 19th century. Nations needed women to both work and birth future workers, which gave women unprecedented bargaining power. Most European states passed some form of unpaid leave by the end of the 19th century. But in the US, the availability of cheap labor due to the echoes of slavery rendered female labor less necessary. Slavery, of course, had been abolished, but sharecropping and other forms of more or less indentured labor kept a servile black workforce in place. Back in Europe, the movement for more maternity benefits got a major boost from World War I. To make a long story short, when millions of men went to fight in the trenches of World War I, millions of women staffed the jobs they left behind. In France, husky mademoiselles handled the wings like toys. And when many of those men came back injured, or not at all, working women gained bargaining power. Europe was much more destroyed physically, that need for physical rebuilding and, and sort of this push for all hands on deck to rebuild. And so more women remained in the workforce, largely out of necessity. 
Activists lobbied for 12 weeks of paid leave, and while countries didn't immediately comply, the stage was set for future reforms, especially when World War II left Europe even more battered just a few decades later. But in the U.S., the lack of physical destruction and the comparably small number of deaths again rendered female labor a little less necessary. In the United States, after World War II, the men came back and the idea was largely, okay, thanks women, we really appreciate what you did while we were gone and now we're gonna take our jobs back. Now you may be asking yourself, what about Canada? It's not like the Axis forces stomped all over the Great White North, so how'd they get paid leave? That difference largely comes down to the priorities of feminist movements. While Canadian feminists included paid leave in their activism, American feminists tended to prioritize other issues, like reproductive rights, workplace rights, and passing the Equal Rights Amendment. Between World War II and the late 1980s, most wealthy nations passed maternity leaves with job protection and pay. But the U.S. lagged behind. Representative Patricia Schroeder of Colorado sponsored the first paid leave bill in 1984, but it languished under the Reagan administration. It was reintroduced twice and vetoed twice in the Bush years, despite enormous popularity among the public. And he didn't want to draw a lot of attention to the fact he was vetoing it. So he put out some written statements that just said, uh, I'm a big fan of family leave. I think we should have uh, family leave, but I don't think it's the government's place to do it. Activists used this as a cudgel against Bush in the 1992 election and Bill Clinton promised to pass it if he won. The Family and Medical Leave Act was the first major piece of legislation he signed on February 5, 1993. As much as this was a victory, it was only meant to be a first step. When asked about the FMLA in 2014, Representative Schroeder said, It's still so watered down and everything else. That was 20 some odd years ago. What have you done since? Could you please beef it up? I don't think there's a capital in, a, in the world that talks more about family values and does less. Some progress has been made. The Trump administration passed 12 weeks of paid parental leave for federal employees in 2019. Additionally, as of 2020, 21% of the workforce had access to paid family leave through their employers. But the biggest moves came from individual states, starting with California, which passed the first paid leave law in 2002. They claim it would be a job killer. They claim it will be abused that uh, Aunt Mary will have a hangnail and somebody will want to take off from work to take care of her. This is Eileen Applebaum. She studied the effects of California's law and found that 91% of businesses reported either no effect or a positive effect on profitability. It did not reduce productivity. It did not reduce profitability. It increased morale. It reduced turnover. <laughs> Why this works is pretty simple. Firstly, it's funded through a small tax amounting to about 1% of a worker's first $118,000 in earnings. Uh, and because it's spread out of, over the entire workforce and because workers do not take advantage of it, the expenses are quite low. Secondly, it reduces turnover, which is one of the most expensive parts of running a business. I remember talking to a top executive at a California uh, uh, IT company, and he said to us, well, you know, I've been in many, many meetings and I have never heard anyone say, well, you know, if it wasn't for paid family and medical leave in California, our share price would be through the roof. Since California, eight more states and DC have passed their own paid leave laws. And in March, over 250 companies sent a joint letter to Congress requesting paid leave at the federal level. Which may actually happen, since both President Biden and Massachusetts Representative Richard Neal recently proposed paid leave plans. Who would have thought that two old white guys would be the ones fighting over whose bill is going to get passed? I love it. And with 82% of Americans in favor of paid leave, is it just a matter of time? Your ability to take a paid leave should not depend on what state you're working in or on what we call the boss lottery. I welcome every big company with deep pockets that provides these benefits to its workers. 
but I don't really think we can require businesses to provide these benefits. They're expensive if you do it one business at a time. They're cheap if you do it for the workforce of an entire state or an entire country. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future videos.